The purpose of this video is to help architecture students and early professions navigate the architectural practice. I think if you attend architecture school, sometimes you are presented two different extremes. One extreme is maybe the very iconic design architect identity. And then the other extreme is this very pragmatic, efficient, non-design narrative about design in the architectural profession. And I don't think in architecture school, at least, there's ever a complete narrative and discussion about the different types of architectural practices. And so I am hoping that this video can provide a very clear glimpse and understanding and also uh, a kind of navigation through the different types of architectural practices. I need to start off with a disclaimer. This video is definitely for information purposes only. I am going to go actually into a lot of detail about the different types of architectural practices, but I'm not really promoting any kind of firm or promoting any kind of practice. But again, I am going to show you examples. And it's definitely like not a criticism. I'm not saying that this firm is good or this firm is bad. I may say that this firm produces beautiful work or their process of design is very interesting, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm really promoting these offices as in go work here or go work there. Absolutely not. Uh, definitely, architecture is a collaborative process. Again, I think another unfortunate point is that in architecture school, it's almost highly individualistic, but in reality, it's a very collaborative process, especially in the professional world. And so, all architectural practices we have employees and these employees are very talented and very hardworking that's subjective how you define talented hardworking but just architecture in general it's a profession that requires a lot of diligence and a lot of commitment and finally all practices have their pros and cons uh, and so maybe for some they found the holy grail of the architectural firm that they want to work for or that they have created themselves but in general you need to understand that Again, all practices do have their pros and cons, so you need to always manage your expectations. And that's something I'm going to talk about later on in this video. In architecture, there are three types of architectural practices, and they have overlaps. And in general, the architectural practice as a whole is in the service industry. An architect provides their architectural services to a client, to an individual, to a developer, to the city, to a government, to a, even a country sometimes, right? So as a whole, the architectural practice is under the umbrella of the service industry. Some people might debate that, but currently that's its category. I don't want to go into too much detail about that. Now, the three types of practices that you see in the architectural discipline is either going to be a service-based architectural practice or second is an architectural practice that's both service and design driven. And then the third practice is that it's highly design driven. And then there's going to be overlaps. So you might have a service driven office that's that leans more towards design, or you have a service and design driven practice that leads more towards the service sector, or you might have a service and design practice that leans more towards the design identity or design emphasis. And then the third one, again, is the design focused practices that are typically very iconic. And, you know, some people might label them as star architect offices. But again, I'm going to go into a lot of detail about each of these practices. And personally, for me, my first experience of architecture was actually in the heavily design centric practices. I actually worked for what you would call a star architect office in Japan. And so I was kind of thrown into the deep end, I guess, the design deep end quite quickly. And then Later on, I transitioned to the service and design type of practice until I started my own practice. I'm based in the U.S. and I'm also a licensed architect in a couple of states. But 
I have either worked with clients in all three of these sectors, definitely worked in firms in both of these sectors, and I have contracted in the service sector as well. So I have gotten a very clear glimpse of all three practices. So let's just talk about the service industry first. Typically in the service industry, you're going to either be a person or an architect or a designer who works in-house for a company. And that company can be operated by developers or tech companies, fashion companies, retail, food. That's the more of the in-house realm. Or you can maybe be like a liaison or a project manager for like the county for your local jurisdiction where you are the middle person or the middle man between the hired architect who may have won the, RF, the RFP in a public project and you're like the architect that represents the client and to help communicate the design process and the project process across the entire span of the life of the project. And then finally, you can also be an architect of record office, like literally an office that acts as the architect of record for other architects. There are actually a number of firms that actually do this, where they're just the, some call them executive architects, some call them architect of record, where the, that's the, their entire business model. I want to give three different examples of working in like the service sector uh, as an architect or as a designer. So if you look here, this is an ad by Apple for a spatial and fixture designer. And if you look at the last sentence uh, of the description or the summary, it says, and secondly, spatial overseeing design of new construction and modifications of design studios. They actually have a, a much longer description than this, but in general, you can be someone who oversees work, who either helps put in a construction document set or helps put production drawings in for a hired architect or for smaller projects that represent that company. Another example is at Nike, right? So they have, if you look on the right, facilities specialist two in Japan, but obviously they have all over the United, all over the world, in the US, Europe, Asia. And if you just look at, you know, the skills they're looking for, you know, AutoCAD and uh, Photoshop, the Adobe Suite, three years of project and construction management. And so again, you're working really with the facilities. You're either uh, going to help design, you know, like a Nike store, for example, or Nike corporate, for example, or they might hire an outside architect. And you're, again, like that middle person or that liaison who might help that process, maybe with just production drawings or help oversee the work locally. And then thirdly, again, Starbucks, store designer, store development. And if you again look at the right about the experience and the qualifications, you know, Revit, AutoCAD, understanding retail design, furniture and finishes, you're just working in-house for a bigger company, right? And if we look at an actual physical example, this is an Apple store in a mall, right? This is something that you would probably do as an in-house designer, something that you would actually design. I'm not saying this is what they're promoting, but I'm just saying in general, when you work like as a store designer for a company, they'll either have like, you know, a very local store and you will design like, you know, a very small local store, right? And it's very boilerplate template that you're going to keep the very, I guess, repetitive or consistent design language like materials and finishes and stay within a certain set of parameters. And then if you look here, right, this is the flagship store in Singapore designed by Norman Foster. This is where they would hire an outside architect and then you would probably act as like a liaison or a middle person for that project. Uh, and so you have like these two realms. And so that's why if we go back to the slide uh, that I showed earlier. And so if you notice these lines that you see here, right, the lines can either be, you know, leaning more towards design where like that example I showed you of that smaller Apple store, you are designing, but you're designing within a, a very certain set of parameters 
or it jumps over to like the high design or the very design centric practices where they will hire that outside architect and you are not really collaborating with them, but you are like, again, this middle person or liaison where you are facilitating their work by giving them the design standards or giving them, you know, certain parameters to work in. Now, the next example is service and design. And this is where you find the majority of architectural practices. Again, like I said in the beginning of this video, sometimes the architectural curriculum focuses or presents works at two extremes. They either present works at the very high design, iconic design practices, or they might present designs that are just very service uh, driven, meaning uh, it's not that design oriented. Maybe it might be just a lot about uh, systems and efficiency and structure. And I'm not saying those are either good or bad, but the reality is the vast majority of practices are somewhere in the middle. They either lean more to design or they lean more to uh, service. And my personal opinion, and I'm going to say this again uh, towards the end of this video, is that there are so many amazing design practices or architectural practices, excuse me, that are really pushing the envelope of design, structure, systems, sustainability, and you don't even know about them. Because uh, to reach like the iconic level of architecture, it's quite difficult, but that does not mean you're not a successful practice. Not at all, not whatsoever. I think it's just the, you know, the world that we live in, but luckily now, you know, with so many architectural websites and blogs, people just discover more and more practices, even though you may not have ever heard of them before. It's just that this profession is highly saturated with so many amazing practices that you've never heard of. And so it's almost something that definitely needs to change in the architectural curriculum, especially on the design end where we always just emphasize these architect offices. Um, so again, the vast majority of architectural practices fall in this middle point here. And again, they either lean to the design or lean to service. And what's really important is that in the service and design sector, they have to foster a client relationship, meaning that a client will come to them maybe for like a residential design, right? But they might also go to another office as well to see what they can offer for the same project type. So like clients are kind of shopping around and it's your job as someone who works at this office to like kind of foster a relationship with the client and build trust with the client so you, that you can capture that project. Unfortunately for some, not all, for some practices, it's sometimes a race to the bottom. And this is something that architectural practices really need to stop doing where they definitely want the project, but then they'll lower their fees and keep lowering their fees so that they can get that project. And that's something you absolutely want to avoid because it's just not a healthy business model. It's not healthy for business practices or even for just work culture. But again, that's just something that's very important about the service and design is that you, you're, you're fostering these client relationships. And the reason why this is important is because when we get to the more like iconic design practices, it's a different type of client relationship. And then these service and design practices, you know, they work either on public or private works. And they can sometimes even work with developers. They can do test fits, and they can also themselves be architects of record. And again, if you can see these lines, these projects can either lean to the design. So like you can do a residential project or let's say like a museum or a library or private condos. And for these like public, private and developers, they can lean to the design. And sometimes developers will hire architects from outside of their office, but they want like a very boilerplate design. And so it's not like you're really putting that much I guess, I don't want to say rigor, but like you're trying to make it as efficient as possible. So you are technically designing, but it's just more based on efficiency than really trying to create an identity of design for your practice, which is a very different pursuit. Uh, and so uh, that's why for developers, I have it leaning both towards the service side 
and towards the design side. And then test fits is very service driven, right? Sometimes a client will want you to do test fits just to see if the project is even feasible at like a general scale level. It's not really about design, it's more about square footage. And then architect of record, that is pure service. You are never ever designing as an architect of record. That is not your role as an architect of record. Your role as an architect of record is to make sure that the design architect's design intent is carried through through the process and your job is to make sure that it's you know carried through from like the permit level right and the construction administration level and again i'll go into detail about the collaboration between let's say the design architect and the architect of record role but again in general the service design is more uh, what you see as the majority of architectural practices across the world, across the globe. And I'm going to show you examples towards the end of this presentation of this like middle circle or the middle circle that kind of overlaps with the design. So I'm going to show you a good number of architectural practices that are service and design, but lean more towards design. And again, I'm not promoting these offices. They're just examples of like different scales and different project types, program types, context, intent. Okay. And then we have like the design centric offices that some people might categorize them as a star architect offices. And the big distinguishing factor is that the design centric offices, they are sought out by clients. Clients come to them and they only come to them. They want their work specifically. So they don't have to like foster a client relationship like you do in a service and design pr practice where a client might come to them, but they really haven't like established this trust. They haven't really got a feel about their design process that much. They might like some of the designs in their, in their studio or in their office, but there's, they might be shopping around with other architects. It's not like that in the design centric or like store architect offices where clients are coming directly to them and they want their design specifically because they just love their work. They love their design ethos, their design identity. And so that's like a huge distinguishing factor. Even though they are sought out by clients and that clients only want them, it doesn't mean that you're not going to do your due diligence towards your client. There are client obligations that you always need to fulfill. But as I said, the fostering process is shortened or it's not even present anymore because they already want you, they want your design and they're not gonna haggle you on fees because they truly believe in the work that you pursue. And then definitely there's this uh, a prominent international recognition. Again, the service and design might have some international recognition, but not as much as like the Star Architect offices where their primary identity is really about international recognition, whether their works are international or they're just known internationally all over the world. But that's like a huge distinguishing factor as well. And they definitely go after competition work. It's not just like public and private and developer work, but they definitely also go after competitions that might not be as how I would say like uh, feasible from a business perspective in the two other sectors. And so when I say competitions, I don't mean like public, uh, local RFP, RFQs. I'm talking about like international competitions that anyone kind of apply to. Uh, and sometimes these offices, these uh, these design centric offices are actually invited exclusively to apply for these competitions. You do have like I said earlier, there are public RFQ and RFPs that are found in all of the United States. In Europe, I would say they have a more healthy public competition platform for architects. In the United States, they typically, for like public projects, they'll establish an RFP, RFQ, and you can, or if, if, if you want to do it in order, it's actually RFQ and then RFP. Uh, request for qualifications and request for proposals. And if you're like a local architect that really wins a lot of these projects, you kind of get shortlisted in these like local public projects in the US. But in general, the design, the, the design centric offices, they're going after big time international competitions. And again, this is, I'm not even in the details yet. I'm just giving you just like a basic overview. And so now if we see all three side by side, you're going to see how they're all kind of interlinked in some way. So like, for example, the service industry, right? Let's say like that Apple example I showed you, they might lean a little bit towards design or they might ask a star architect to design their office, for example, right? And then again, 
For developers, you can work for an in-house developer in a service sector, or your client can be a developer where you're either going to be more on the service role or on the design role. And then a developer can go to like a start architect to design like a very high end exclusive condo for like billionaires, for example. Right. And then this is just like a summary of what I talked about. One thing that I want to point out are firm sizes. So in like typical business, like if we just ignore architecture for a second and we think about typical firm sizes, uh, a small firm and like a typical business practice is like anything below like a hundred. That's not the case in architecture. In architecture, I would say that the small, medium, large scale office employee count is very different. So like a small office in like architecture is like anything below 20. In my opinion, some people will disagree with this. And then a medium office is like from 20 to 75 people. And then a large office is like 75 plus because, you know, building buildings, they take time, like, you know, from either a year and a half to five, six, seven, eight years. And so to get that flow of projects and to get that number of people to work on that project is like, is like a huge balance. And so uh, that's why, even though once you hit like the corporate side of, of practices, they might employ a lot of people. It's, it's a huge balance of trying to employ a lot of people and keeping the business intact and making sure you're getting projects in for building new buildings, right? So that's why if you look at even like big time architectural offices, like big corporate offices, you know, maybe maximum a thousand employees, but that's like nothing compared to like big time tech companies, for example, right? Where they have tens of thousands of employees. Uh, so uh, that's why the, the term small, medium, large office size is very different compared to like the tech sector or the law sector or the medical sector, for example, right? Okay, so this is just a summary, but I'm definitely going to actually go into further detail about the pros and cons and what you'll do in each of these office types. So in the service side, again, it's like medium and large firm sizes. And not even firms, you're probably going to work for a company, right? You're probably going to work for like, you know, a very famous tech uh, firm or a famous fashion firm or cosmetics firm. Uh, so they might, the firm itself might be quite large. And then the projects are either going to be local, regional, maybe national, maybe international. Uh, so like you might have to like work at like a re maybe like you're a store designer that has to design a local store at a local mall, or you might be a store designer that has to design a store in Chicago. And then you have to fly down to Florida uh, in Miami. And then you have to fly to Los Angeles to do another s a small store, right? So you might do that nationally, or you might just be regional on the East coast, West coast, the South, right? So that's why the, your your travel distance might vary in these service firms if you work for like retail or tech or something like that. And then you'll most likely produce production drawings and construction drawings. And it's very like boilerplate, right? You're doing a lot. Uh, it's very it's like a very efficient workflow where it's just the same program over and over again. Right. So the, the projects and the tasks are very specific. We have to design this much square footage with these types of finishes you know, and this type of pro it's the same program over and over again. So it's very repetitive. And so you might get to experience a little bit of the design process and the permitting process and the construction administration process, but it's not going to be as constant, right? So like, for example, if you are designing a retail store in Chicago, but you're working out of New York City, for example, you're not going to fly over to Chicago every week to check out the store. You might fly out like once a month, right? And so that's why you might do construction administration, just not as frequently as like in the middle of the service and design firms. And then, you know, you are going to learn about like management and consultant coordination, just maybe not as deeply as the, the middle, the service and design firms. The service and design firms, uh, you know, they can be small, like boutique, medium or large, like a like a corporate office. I would definitely place the corporate offices in this uh, in, in the middle sector. And again, corporate offices can either lean to the right design or lean to the left, which is more service. And so work types, or I guess the, the context of where they work, again, it can be local or regional or national, international. You can definitely learn how to run a practice in a service and design industry. And so I put in parentheses because and I'm going to go into a lot of detail about this in the next, next slide, but depending on the scale of the project, you might 
be more specialized in specific roles, like maybe the technical role or the design role. And I'll go into detail about this in the next slide. You would definitely get a more of a design process experience and get to see projects from start to finish. And again, I'm speaking about this in generalities. There are, there's always going to be exceptions. You get to see the permit process and the construction drawings and construction administration. You get to interact with clients. You know, you get to have a lot of administrative and management roles and obviously consul uh, consultant coordination. And once you hit management, you have to learn how to delegate tasks. So there's just more responsibility and like multiple project types. And again, you might have very specific forums that only do schools, that only do resident, you know, residential design, that only do retail design. So there are always going to be exceptions, obviously. But in general, the service and design firms is where you'll probably like experience just the overall project process in architecture. Uh, and then you have, you know, the design centric offices, and those are typically medium and large firms. And, you know, they have like a design, th a design ethos, a design identity, and they're very design focused. And, you know, they are catered more towards like highbrow culture. And they are everything local, regional, national, international. And they definitely have these like novel methods of designing and pushing boundaries in construction, engineering, MEP. And you definitely will most likely travel internationally, whether it's for competitions or for like international projects. And there's just more of an emphasis on schematic design and design development in these practices. It does not mean you don't work on details or you don't work on construction documents because everything is designed. So you wanna make sure that your details are already in the design development set. It's not like you don't work on a construction document set, it's just that uh, per legality, right? Like legality, if you are working for like a design centric office, right? And you have an international project you can't stamp those drawings, right? You're going to have to give it to an architect of record who's going to stamp those drawings for them. And so that's their construction document set, you know. And so it doesn't, but again, it does not mean if you work at a store architect office, oh, you're not going to work on details or you're not going to work on, uh, I guess, the constructability of a project. Absolutely, that's not true. You have, you actually will because once you start to design things at a very high level, everything is designed. So you don't want someone to just, you don't want to give someone else control over your design where they start to mess around with your alignments of your details or uh, certain spatial proportions or material details, for example, or material connections because of some like RFI that they get, right? Like you're definitely going to be involved in the process. It's just that per legality, you have to give that to an architect of record to just stamp. And then the architect of record is their job is to make sure that your design intent is intact, right? And so they might offer their suggestions to help you in that, but they're not going to like give you their opinions on how to change design. So that's why I have like construction drawings, construction admin, and consultant coordination in parentheses, because you are going to experience it, just not at like the full nitty gritty scale that you would in the service and design sector. Okay, now the pros and cons. Now, like I said, all offices, all sectors have their pros and cons, and honestly, it's subjective. And again, I am speaking in generalities. You're going to find overlaps and you're going to find exceptions, always, always, always. So just keep that in mind. In general, service practices will pay you the most and you get the best benefits and most likely better schedule. And I, but I'm going to tell you times when you don't at like service driven firms. And then you actually, in some instances, will actually get really interesting exposure to like designers and products. So like if you work for like a high end company, right, whether it's Apple or Google, for example, right, when they design things for their spaces, they, they have the, I guess, access, they have access to, you know, high quality materials, right? and high quality finishes. So you get to be exposed to these things that maybe a more budget driven project or company may not have access to, right? And then you get to work obviously on drawing sets. Sometimes you get to work on drawing sets from start to finish, or you work on it, do design development, and then give the give like, you know, 50 to 100% construction documents to an architect of record. And then you'll definitely do construction administration, just not as frequently, unless it's like a super local project 
or you're based off of. So like, for example, if your project is based in New York and you work in New York, then you'll do construction administration at like a frequent level, right? Where you visit every week at OAC meetings. But if your project is in a completely different state, then you're probably going to visit maybe once a month, you know, or at most, at most twice a month. And then uh, your work is very focused because you're just designing the same program over and over again. So if you're designing Apple stores or you're designing Starbucks or you're designing <laughs> Wendy's or Chipotle, I can keep going, or even like Walmarts or uh, like Ross dress for less. I'm, these are very American examples, by the way. Like, yes, you have people like designing even like, I guess the most basic of stores, you need an architect to design that. Right. And so the work is just it's just the same program over and over again. So it's very efficient. It's based off of templates. And like I said before, like it's uh, you will travel. The pro or con, depending on how you do it, is just the firm size. You know, you might work at a very huge company. Like I said, these companies are very large. So you can't, there isn't like really this like attachment to the company because you work in a very specific niche of the company. All right. Now the cons is that even though I said these are the offices that probably give you the best time and the best salary and benefits, sometimes because the projects are so repetitive, they might overwork you with the same project types just at different locations. So you might be overworked. So like you might have to do like a store design in one state and then another store design in another state and another store design in another state. So they just keep giving it to you over and over again. And so, you know, it's important to know how to delegate work, but just try to find a, I guess, a, cons a consistent work method. But that does sometimes happen. And nothing's too predictable. It, like, you know, it can just be boring. It might feel boring. It might feel like a cog, you know, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. And then there's no autonomy of design. This is actually really important because you are working within a specific set of parameters. You obviously will put in your input. You know, there might be a creative director or a design director. Like you might have like designers, project designer, design director, creative director, and like head of marketing, for example, right? And so the person who might get the final say might not even be a designer. It might even be an architect. It might be the developer, for example, right? Or it might be the marketing director whose specialty is marketing. So sometimes you just don't have the final say whatsoever in the design. And then again, there's a, there's going to be a lack of like full design process because you are working with a specific set of parameters that are given to you. Or like you're an architect of record, for example, where you, you're not even supposed to design. That's not your role. Or you might have like a lack of full exposure of like, you know, going from schematic design all the way to construction administration compared to the service and design sector, right? Where like you're constantly doing construction administration or you're always taking things to permit. You might not take things to permit. You might just take things to schematic or DD and then give it to an arc of record and then they take it to permit for you. And then there might just be no growth in politics. Honestly, you're going to sign it, find these in all three, depending on the work culture. But the no growth politics, I think in this scenario is that, you know, if the positions are very scarce and everyone's really trying to hold on to their position, because it's, again, you're in a very niche position in a company, people might really want to hold on to their roles, right? So that's something else to watch out for. Now, in the service and design practice, you're going to get Again, I'm speaking in generalities. You're going to get a full exposure to the actual practice, like how to run a practice, not just how to run an architectural project, but just picking up the phone, taking out the trash, understanding overhead, understanding uh, you know, how to communicate with clients, and also just down to like verbal practice or verbal communication skills or uh, communication skills with the client, knowing what to say, knowing what not to say to a client. So these are things that are obviously part of the profession, but things that they don't really tell you about in a school setting. So you get like a full exposure and then the project exposure, right? Schematic design all the way up to, to permitting, construction administration, how to pay the GCs, approval of payments, value engineering, you know, consultant coordination, and then obviously like doing complete drawing sets, uh, you're going to get that entire experience. And that's such an important experience if you really want to pursue architecture as a profession. And then, you know, autonomy of design. So what I mean by this is that you, if you work for like, you know, that service and design driven practice, 
they are the ones that are designing. So if you're working in a, in a team, you your team is making the design together, right? You might be questioning each other. There might be some hierarchy, but in general, the design is an internal dialogue within the practice itself. And then you're going to present it to the client and the client is going to give you their leanings towards what they like, what they don't like, their questions. But in general, there is this level of autonomy that you find in the service and design practice that you don't find in the service driven practices. And then you're going to acquire so many different skill sets, like I said earlier, and the Project types can usually be very diverse. You know, a lot of projects, a lot of, of these practices do like residential and commercial and education and cultural projects like museums. So you can do a lot of different project types. And then, you know, it, because you're doing construction administration in these practices, you get to network with a lot of different builders, a lot of different, different uh, construction companies, which is really helpful if you ever want to venture out on your own. You get to really see. And then obviously you get to network with clients as well, but you get to network with builders, which is really cool because you get to understand the construction industry very well. And not, I should have added this in here. You get to network with your consultants as well, with like mechanical, electrical, plumbing, civil, structural, lighting designers. So you network with a lot of different disciplines. The salaries and the firm sizes, well, the salaries are hit or miss. So like there's some practices that will pay you fairly, some practices that will pay you very well, Generous pay salary. I wouldn't say generous, but they just pay you above the average. And then you have somewhere you are underpaid. And I don't want to throw out numbers. Maybe I can throw out general numbers. But like, if you work in the service sector, you're most likely, most likely going to be starting six figures or, or like very high double figure or very high five figures but most likely you'll be starting six figures. And if you have a lot of experience, you can achieve pretty good six figures in the service sector. You know, like if you're coming in with like five, six, seven, eight, ten years of experience in the service sector and you work for like a tech company, for example, you will get paid and you're not going to do as much work. I'm putting work in quotations. You're not, it's just, you're not going to do as much as I guess the bottom up architectural work in a service sector that you will in a service and design. It's a different type of work in the service in the service sector, but in the service and design sector, you know, when you're doing a project from start to finish, that in itself is a lot of work. And personally, I think architects are totally underpaid. Our profession is embarrassingly underpaid with the amount of skill sets that we have. It's I mean, that's a completely different discussion, but in the service and design, you are going to find practices that either have amazing and very uh, fair uh, packages, salary packages, you know, not just that, just the culture is fantastic, very collaborative. They care about your work. They care making sure that you feel fulfilled, that you're giving a meaningful impact to the company. You know, you're, you're typically going to find those types of emphases in the service and design because the scales aren't that huge, you know? And that's a, that's a really cool thing is that there might be an emphasis on the actual culture of this type of cohort and being supportive of one another. The cons, again, sometimes you might be overworking and you might be working, you know, long hours, right? Uh, because you don't have maybe the luxury of giving your work to an architect of record. You might even be the architect of record, right? And you're just taking on so many roles, you know, whether it's the schematic design level to DD, preparing, preparing presentations, uh, looking at RFIs and shop drawings, or, you know, responding to permit sets and doing constant construction administration every week. Those things, you know, they're draining. Uh, they take a lot of time. It might lack consistency. So you might be working on so many different project types. And so maybe you, you actually want more of a consistent practice where you want to work on a very specific project type. And then like b business instability. Uh, this is something that you're going to find in, I would say, the service and design sector and then the design centric sector where, you know, a lot of times there's like furloughing and layoffs because there's just no clients, right? Again, on the service sector, you're not really working for a client. You're working inside of a company that does other things. So you're not really worried about the, the company is its own client, for example, right? But in the service and design Again, it's about fostering client relationships. So if you don't have client, if you don't have clients, you don't have projects, you don't have projects, you're going to get laid off, right? And then 
OK, pigeon hold. <laughs> I should have put a dash there, but once, once offices get larger, once you work for a large practice, again, speaking generalities, you might get pigeonholed because of two reasons, because of like efficiency and of economy. And two things happen in much larger practices. Either it's structured where they put you into very small teams and then that small team owns the project, which is good, right? That's actually nice because it's still like a little small practice. Like everyone has their own little tiny practice, right? So that, that's actually a good thing because you get to still experience things as a whole. But then in other very large practices, they might have like the designers and they only design and then the technical people and they only do consultant coordination from start to finish and do construction documents. And then you have the project managers who are making sure everyone is on task and on budget, right? So if you're in that, sometimes you're stuck in there and it's very hard to transition not always, but again, in general. So that's something to watch out for. And then no growth in politics. I think in here, I think the politics really start to hit uh, once you're in like the very, very big offices, right? Where it gets very competitive. I think in smaller practices and smaller firms, like the small and medium firms, there's room to grow because everyone needs to take on a role. Everyone needs to, you know, uh, learn to do things because not because, you know, there's not that many people and projects are getting built. And sometimes you, you need to switch gears and help someone out on construction administration, for example. Or maybe switch gears and help someone out on a schematic design set or construction document set. Okay. Now, the design-centric offices. You know, some people might call them star architects. I don't like to use that word, but, you know, that's what everyone understands. And again, I have worked in the service and design sector. And I've also worked for a Star Architects office. So I'm giving you my firsthand experience, but in a Star Architect office, design is number one. It does not mean that design is not number one in the service and design. Again, you have service and design sectors that lean more towards design and design is also number one. But for a design sector, design is number one. Like that's the whole reason why a client comes to them specifically, right? For this certain design identity. It, you may not agree or like their design aesthetics or their design pursuit, but it's definitely there. And they have this design ethos, whether they want to focus on materiality or context or sustainability or massing or whatever design objective that you can think of. It's clearly there. You can clearly see it in their work. I should have put this in a hierarchy, but I'll, I'm going to skip some of these and go back to others. You will be exposed to novel details and novel engineering and novel construction methods, and you're going to resolve details very early on in the drawing set. This is actually super important, so I need to emphasize this. Again, some people think that because you go to a Star Architect office, you're not going to be exposed to construction documents or construction and administration. That's not true. When you work for a Star Architect's office, maybe at the beginning, you're only working from competition to competition, building models, doing a lot of like the schematic design phase, right? But once you're there for not even a long time, you know, for a bit, like maybe a year, two years, you know, two years and a half, you're going to be given more responsibilities where when you work on a project that is going to get built, even if it's international, which is which most likely it is, and definitely because, or definitely even if there is an architect of record, because your design is so important to the identity of the practice, you design everything. Even your details have this specific design language. So you're going to put that early on in your construction document, or not the construction document set, but you're going to put that early on in your drawing set, whether it's schematic design or design development. That's so important because you don't want to give that authority or control to anyone else. And so it takes a lot of rigor and a lot of work to maintain that design language through the trajectory of that project. So you want to always have those resolved early on. And so for me, that's actually a pro because you like pro as like a positive, um, because 
you get to think about these things at a design conceptual level when it comes to details and even where you place your MEP systems and where you place your control joints, for example. Uh, you think about these things, not just from like an efficiency or pragmatic level, which you should, uh, but you also think about these things from like a design aesthetic theoretical level as well, which is super cool in my opinion. Like even the structure, the structural details, the structural connections, there's a certain designed element to it that's helping the design language. It's just not, oh, let me put, you know, a, a, let, me, let me put a structural steel column here and put a stiffener there and just call it a day. It's you really want to make sure that if you're going to have these things exposed, you're really thinking about what these things are saying or conveying as a part of your design language as a whole. And then, you know, you're going to do a lot of travel and you're going to be exposed to a lot of culture. It's That's why I said it's like highbrow culture, where like you're just going to be exposed to like highbrow everything. You're going to be, so if you see like my second or third point is exposure to designers, like you're going to be exposed to like amazing artists and amazing installation artists and furniture designers and amazing photographers. You're going to be exposed to like this world of design. That's a little bit like, mm, I don't want to say exclusionary, but, or exclusive, but you know, it's very different. It's very niche. Like you get to be exposed and I, it's really cool though, because it really opens your up, it opens up your eyes to this completely different world of design. And again, these practices, if you go to like any store architect office, I'm going to just make, you know, a, a you know, just a, a grand statement. But if you go to any store architect offices, they are very diverse. Like you'll see people from all over the world, which I thought is super cool. Like I was working in Japan, I was working in Tokyo, but people in the offices were from Europe. You know, they were from all parts of Asia you know, America, South America, like it, it just looked like the United Nations. It was super diverse, super cool. And again, that's why you get exposed to like all these different cultures. And again, you get to network with a lot of creatives. Like I said, exposure to designers, like you get exposed to amazing artists and photographers and builders and craftspeople. It's super, super cool. The pro and con is, uh, you know, it's a medium and large firm size. So if that's something that you don't like, that model I spoke about earlier about you know, these larger practices that have like smaller teams that then end up owning their little project. That's typically what you find in Star Architect practices, where if it's like a very large Star Architect practice, they'll have like a small team and that small team will own that project, right? Like if it's like three or four or five people, sometimes, right? Sometimes it's also broken up like the corporate offices where you're only doing schematic design and then that team is only doing the technical and that team's only doing the project management. You get what I'm saying? So you'll find both, but most likely you'll find the former where it's just smaller teams that carry the project through. Okay. Now the cons of working for these design centric practices is that most likely the salaries are just much Ugh, I don't want to say much less. They are less compared to the service and design and service. Let me put it this way so you just understand. No one says to themselves, I want to get paid a lot and I want to have a lot of free time. So let me go work for a star architect's office. No one says that. Okay, well, we're just going to be very honest here. You know, so the likelihood of you putting in a lot of time overworking and not getting paid that much you're going to find that in these design centric offices. And that's just the reality. You need to know what you're getting yourself into, right? So it's out there. You should know that. And I am in no way supportive of someone or people being overworked and underpaid, but I do need to state the recurrent reality of working in these types of practices. And then even though I said that you get to be exposed to like novel engineering and construction methods, you're not going to see like how a practice is run as detailed as you will in a service and design sector, right? You might see how to put a great schematic and design set together, or you might get a good glimpse of construction administration with respect to really keeping your design intact, right? Uh, but like this idea of getting like a full exposure of practice, not just the project side, but just the practice side of running a practice, you might not get to see that compared to the service and design sector. And then 
the client relationship, right? You may not talk to a client, maybe the project designer or the project architect, and then the actual star architect themselves might be the one really interacting with the client and you're just on the back end uh, most of the time. And then lack of design autonomy. This is very important. You are definitely designing and you are definitely going to have this collaborative back and forth, or there might be just very strict hierarchy, right? But you're, there's def, the design is definitely yours in that realm. But the person who typically has the final say is going to be the quote unquote star architect most of the time. You know, my personal experience, like it was like 11 p.m., 12 a.m., we go in and because in Japan, Japan is just very well known for working very late hours. And so like you go there and you show your design and approve or not approve or work on this, work on that and come back. And so there's just a lot of hierarchy and, aut- and lack of uh, like collaborative autonomy. doesn't mean it's not collaborative, definitely is collaborative, but you guys don't have the final say. And if we just go back to the service and design sector, yes, they have principles and project designers, but you know, the principles there are probably so busy trying to find more projects that as long as it's really falling within the, I guess, design language that the principal approves of, there's more of, uh, there's more autonomy there. But here, you know, you can work and work and just say, no, change the entire thing. It's not good, you know? And then, you know, it could, there could be some like gatekeeping and like pretentious persona in there because you're just surrounded by so much highbrow culture that you start to like look down sometimes at like, other designers or other practices or other people. And it can become very competitive, very, very competitive because the whole nature is just quite competitive in there. And even though I said it's collaborative uh, on the back end, you know, people are trying to hit project designer or project manager or try to get closer to that so-and-so star architect. So you do have that definitely very high turnover, very high turnover. People aren't there. I mean, you definitely have people that will stay there for decades, but a lot of times people are two years, one year, three years, whether they're interning or they just want to, you know, get that, get that very well-known name. And then they go over most likely to the service and design sector, right? Again, they have the same issues of business instability compared to, uh, or uh, similar to the service and design sector, because it's contingent on clients. And even if clients are seeking these firms out specifically, you know, if the economy is just very bad and people, you know, aren't moving or not building housing or don't want to go to museums or stuff like that, you know, clients aren't going to come to them. You have to, they're going to lay people off. And then again, even though you're putting a lot of detail and resolving details very early on in drawing sets, you're not working on a complete 100% drawing set, even though it most likely is legally If you're working like on an international competition where you need an architect of record, you're going to need to hand off that drawing to an architect of record. Okay, so what I want to do next is I want to show you some practices that lean in the center, like service and design, but also lean more towards the design side. And I want to show like a like a growth, right? From like very local, that's like maybe does like local regional and like regional and then national, and then we go international and uh, just show how there's just so many amazing practices out there that you may or may not have heard of. And so there's room for everyone. And again, I need to say this, and this is so important. You need all three practices. You need service driven practices you need service and design driven practices you need design centric practices they all need each other and they're all co-dependent on each other and that's why there's these overlaps because you yourself whoever you, the person listening to this video and watching this video you might become this designer that wins a competition in a completely different country, and you're going to need an architect of record, for example, right? Or you might design a very complex project. Maybe you design a skyscraper, and you just don't know anything about the logistics of skyscrapers. You're going to need a practice that focuses just on skyscrapers to help you with that, you know? Or maybe you design a stadium, 
for example, or a swimming pool, for example, right? You're going to, uh, okay, swimming pool, you have swimming pool consultants, of course, but you do have like architects, even like facade engineers or facade designers for a practice. Or for example, you want a competent and skilled architect of record who is familiar with novel details that have worked maybe with other star architects, for example, right? So you need all three. You need people pushing design theory. You know, you need people pushing the envelope of engineering and aesthetics and materiality and coming up with new ways of using materials. You need all three. And so that's why it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't matter where you work. There's no good or bad with where you work. You just need to know what you're looking for. And I'm going to go into detail about this later in the video. I need to emphasize something. Even though I'm saying that you need all three types of practices, I don't mean you need the negative aspects of the culture that goes along with it. But even though that may seem like I'm supporting those types of practices, if you think about it, I guess from an individual standpoint, there's going to be someone who's going to do something that's quite avant-garde, that's going to really push the boundary of something in any discipline. And so it's no different in architecture. And so they all kind of feed off of each other. Let me just go ahead and just show some examples of, again, this more of like the center sector, the service and design sector, and just go from a small scale to like large scale international. Again, I'm not promoting any of these practices. I'm not saying they're good or bad. I'm not saying that they have all these pros or cons. I need to really emphasize this. And honestly, I hope this doesn't get struck down because of copyright, but I definitely just want to show these because I think it's just great to see these examples. One last thing that I want to emphasize about these examples I'm going to show is that these examples are literally a drop in the ocean with respect to the number of architectural practices there are in the world or even just in the United States, for example. And even just the sheer amount of talent, it's, there's just too many talented architects out there that are not getting enough recognition. So again, this is literally a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Just want you to keep that in mind. Okay, again, remember, if you go back to the service sector, maybe you might do something in the service sector where you're working literally for Apple Corporation and you're a designer doing in-house design for like a small mall. And then Apple might hire a star architect or a well-known name firm like Norman and Foster that will design a flagship store, for example, right? So you have that with like the service sector. But again, I want to focus on the service and design firms that are kind of doing it all and that lean more towards design. And I'll go quickly. And again, I, I'm actually showing like distinct practices, like practices that are in major cities, even though I am going to show ones in major cities. So like, for example, this is Rick Joy, Studio Rick Joy. I think they're based out in Arizona, I think. Yes, they're based out in Arizona. And his work has evolved a lot over time. I mean, he used to do a lot of rammed earth work. His studio used to do, and again, this is very collaborative, right? There's people that work at these practices and you know, they're helping each other out and they're helping the practice grow. So it's very collaborative. And I always like to mention the studio does this work, not just one person or the practice does the work. And so again, just, you know, work that's very, I guess, quiet. It's not like loud work. It's, it's quiet. It's modest. It's really about materiality, views, context, and again, this is based off of Arizona. It's not like in this major metropolitan city, but still producing beautiful work. I definitely recommend checking out Rick Joy's work. Uh, another one is Marlon Blackwell. They do super awesome work. I think Marlon Blackwell is uh, based out of, if I correct, Arkansas. I, and you know, he's more of the Midwest and the South. Does work all over the U.S., but Marlon Blackwell does a lot of super beautiful projects that are, you know, contextually driven, that are driven, you know, by materiality, by mass. And again, their office is based off of based out of Arkansas. I'm not putting I'm not putting Arkansas down or anything like that. But again, people typically will try to associate high design with major metropolitan cities, and that's not the case whatsoever. 
And I'll go into detail later on about this, but work is just fantastic, very thoughtful work. And again, if you look, the scale is all pretty much similar, right? It's not like a crazy, you know, like, uh, like, you know, crazy, huge master plan projects, for example, beautiful work. I'm kind of a little nervous to show kids in here, but like just super beautiful project materiality, thing about materials, thing about landscaping. It's a specific like ambiance of the work. And then another work, another office, Lake Flato, super beautiful local work. They do various project types, a lot of project types. They really think about context and energy and sustainability and materiality. Their office is based in Texas, but then they do a lot of work all over the U.S., but mainly I would say focusing on Southern and Midwest, maybe the West. But again, like this project is so beautiful. And like, you know, again, I'm saying this is more in the service and design sector, lean more towards design, right? Where they are thinking like these details, like you need to really think about these structural details at a design level, not just about like, oh, man, let me put some columns and some beams and call it a day. Like these, these take so much rigor and so much time to coordinate with your MEP systems and think about roof thicknesses and making sure that all the, the way you display your systems all, you know, all coalesce, right? And so this is just so clean. It's so beautiful. And so, you know, this takes a lot of work. And if you could just imagine working in, in these kinds of practices, you're going to be exposed to all this experience. And again, if you look at their project website and you look at like their, the, the, the staff page or like about page, you could just, I, I don't know. I don't know them personally, so I can't like make you know personal calls, but again, I mean, I mean, I just got to break, but like, look at, look at the door. Like, I mean, you know, like, Look how like the door could could have just been this like ugly you know egress door, but even the door is just beautifully clad in the same material. Even though obviously like you have to do this per code, right? This has to be per code per like you know the number of occupants that you have in the space. But it's just like it's like you know this stuff takes rigor. It takes time to think about. You know the same thing with you know the the what is it called like the heating and the, and the flu. Like these things take time and take rigor, and so. It's just super nice to see offices like that that aren't, you know, in like the architect realm, but they're still doing super thoughtful work that's very emphatic of design and construction and engineering. And again, you know, like energy and conservation and stuff like that. Definitely worth checking out their projects. Okay, Snow, Julie Snow, Krylik. They're based in, I got a I forgot where the school, where they're, they're based in, Mini, again, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am going to show you offices that are in major cities, but I'm doing this on purpose where I'm showing practices like that are in the Midwest and in the South, because again, people typically associate high design with big time metropolitan cities. But I, I want to show that even in the Midwest, okay, not even in the Midwest, but in the Midwest and in the South, like there are practices that are producing beautiful work, collaborative, contextual work. And so definitely worth checking out this office. And if you can notice, the scale is getting larger in this compared to the other two. Now we're bumping up the scale. And then again, okay, okay, Weissman Freddy. Weissman Freddy, I think a lot of people know Weissman Freddy. Some people might consider them star architects. I don't know. I would still put them more in the, the, the design century, not design, but the service and design, and then lean more towards design because their projects are very design uh, driven. They do a lot of landform buildings. They do their projects are very national. They're working all over the U.S., so they definitely might work with architects of records. They just might not have like that that like iconic marketing feel of a star architect. But their works are very prominent, pretty not pretty, but very well known in the architectural field. But like anytime I look for like a land form precedent for design, I always go to Weissman Freddy. Like they just do, and even though they're not known just for that, I think they do a, a really cool job at doing land form design, but they've done tons of educational work. And so, I mean, this isn't on purpose, but so far these are like a lot of either husband and wife firms or like, like, you know, uh, woman and man, like leading roles in the offices and, you know, Deborah Burke, 
again, large scale work, does a lot of different types of uh, work, different programs from very like intimate residential to like big time cultural institutional projects. Again, based in the US, uh, Weissman, Freddie and Burke, they're both, you know, they're very New York offices. They're based in New York and definitely worth checking out. Okay. All right. So now Thomas Life. So this is like, we're, uh, I, I got to go back to the presentation and just show you something. I think Thomas Pfeiffer is like right here, like right at this. And I would say even Weissman Freddy is like right here. This is where I would put them. Definitely in here, but they're like really in the, this like sector here. Okay. It's just that, I mean, Thomas Pfeiffer, they, there's a couple firms in here that are very curated. Their work is very curated. And so Thomas Pfeiffer is definitely one of them. When you look at their website and you look at their works, there, there's like this common thread that you can feel in their work. This is the Glenstone Museum, super beautiful. Again, this takes so much work to resolve. Their work, their details on their projects are phenomenal. The details, like the, the details that get, like the detail of this, of the glass is just, I've been here. It's 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 nuts. It's things that people maybe not appreciate, but just like the way the glass continues all the way up. I think Todd Williams, Billy Cien, another architectural practice, they've done this detail as well in some of their projects. But you know, the details in this project, it takes so much like it looks so simple and so boring, but to be honest, it takes so much work and so much coordination with like you, you have to coordinate with your structural engineers with your mep with the thicknesses and make sure that you're not doing things silly right like and you know when it comes to doing things in construction like you know alignments in this projects are so key the more minimal your projects are the more your details and your alignments are going to be exposed and so you know if your soil levels are off it's going to throw everything off and that definitely happens in construction administration in new construction where you work you know on a site and they're like oh you know the soil elevation is actually four inches taller so then everything needs to shift up four inches and that just you know that can give you a huge headache so this might look like super simple and maybe like a little austere i think it's beautiful i think it's a super cool project but I can guarantee you there's so much rigor involved in maintaining this type of design aesthetic throughout the architectural process from schematic design all the way to construction administration. And so they have a phenomenal staff that can pull this work off. Not as much built work as like Weissman Freddy, for example, but the work that is built, like it's just super top notch. You know, again, I, I've seen this building a lot of times in DC. It's just super clean. And that's like, you know, just indicative of their work. Okay. Brayhan Architects. They're based in the South. I think Alabama. Is it Louisiana? I got to scroll down. I know for a fact Trahan Architects is based in the South. I got to find. Let me just do about. Uh, New Orleans. That's where the other be. Yeah, they're in New Orleans. Their work is... Again, I would say if in that little diagram I showed you, they're in like that in between between like design centric and like service and design, very design driven, but service and design because they build a lot of their own work. They obviously work with architects of records, but they also build locally. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have actually seen this project. This project is nuts in, in, in like a good way. Like there's just so much going on with different construction methods and materiality. Just so awesome. And I, I just admire it both from, I guess, like an American perspective, because a lot of people just poo poo on American design. And, you know, these are like American designers. I mean, hopefully I don't sound like too, like, ying, ying, like it's jingoistic or jingoistic or like too nationalistic, but I just feel that it's really nice to see this where, you know, these things are being pushed because I would say like mid-century in America, a lot of the design was quite progressive and like just pushing boundaries. And it's so nice and refreshing to see works like I'm showing here, where they're really like pushing things and, you know, really pushing the boundaries of design. And so again, the metal facade is just so cool. People have done this before, but 
this takes so much rigor and design and consideration when you have to collaborate with your engineers of maintaining the design and tact of this project it's just not it might be like a box with like this twisted metal facade right but like it's way more than that when it comes to the actual constructability of this and just again look at the doors like you know it's not like everything is designed you get what i'm saying let's go a little bit international like barkow Leibinger. i probably did not pronounce that correctly whatsoever but frank barkow is an american architect i think and his wife, uh, Regine, is based in Germany. And so their office is really like research driven and really pushing boundaries of materiality and structure. And so I sound very like redundant when I say that, but like if you literally go to their practice, their, their practices are like very clever with like facades and materiality. It's uh, things that you actually really don't see. I mean, this is, I think, a project in Korea, very well known, but like this is just a great glimpse of their work. You know, with how they plan with facades and materiality and structure. And I mean, if you just really go to their selected projects and see the works they do, they've done projects with just amazing, amazing cantilevers and uh, lots of installations. Uh, pretty international. I mean, they, a lot of the work is in Germany, but they have done work in other parts and other countries as well. John Paulson, I would actually say, is probably like design centric. I, I don't, I don't want to show any star architect examples, I, because I really want to emphasize how there's so much amazing talent in the service and design sector that the vast majority of people are probably going to work in. But like, so the vast majority of people work in. So, you know, John John Paulson, if I'm not mistaken, he's not actually like a licensed architect, but Personally, I don't care. It doesn't matter. If you're if you're an amazing designer, you're, you're an amazing designer, period. I don't, you know, th that doesn't bother me whatsoever. I think I think I read in, in one of his interviews that he does have like licensed architects at his practice. But you know, he does a lot of international work. His work again is very curated, very uh, how would I say there's like a common thread in all of his work, even if the work is very eclectic in pro in program type, you definitely see this common thread of like aesthetics and trying to push aesthetics in a certain direction. This is a beautiful project, I think, in, in France, a residential house. I mean, this is just very John Pawson, where it's it's very minimal and austere and uh, very haptic materials, you know, material that you can touch. It's very phenomenal in like the theoretical sense phenomenal. And so if I go back to the works page, you, you can just tell when you look at their work, right? You can just tell by his, when you look at it, like there's this common mood to the work. And it's, it, his work is so photogenic. It's so, and his work is just beautiful. The work that they do at their practice is, is just beautiful. It's just beautiful, in my opinion. And so uh, let me go to, okay. This practice, I know I said that I'm not promoting any work in my original in like the in the intro but i definitely have practices on here where i do go back and i look at their work just to learn things and this next one i'm going to show you i love everything they do just from a design perspective they're called mary and who and they actually used to work in the states i think they used to work for michael graves i could be wrong but everything they do their work is so eclectic but again, like the other two, there's like this common thread that goes through their work. And so some people just don't know about them. You know, they're not like, that's, that's the thing. Like you say their name, like what, like, who are you talking about? And then, and then you're thinking like, how do you not know them? Like they're they're You see, the, you see so much of their work. Sometimes you see their work, but you don't know their name. Right. And so that's why a lot of practices fall in like the service in design and they might push design right? But people still don't know them. And it doesn't even matter because, you know, why do they care? But like their work is just so cool and they always think about materiality and they always think about form and they always think about, you know, how things look in a certain context. And every project is different. They're like every project they work on looks different, but they all have like the same feel, same mood, 
And the details are just like chef kiss, just so good. Material choices are so good. Material composition is so good. The, the way they photograph is just, you know, I mean, okay, the way they photograph, like, it's very like architectural, you know, it's like they treat architecture as an object. Sometimes it's, I wish people showed more people in their spaces, but it's just very aesthetic. A great firm to learn from the absolute for a, it's just a great firm to learn from when it comes to like materiality and material composition. Like when I think of material composition, I always come and check out their work just because the way that they juxtapose different types of materials is it's just like a huge uh, learning experience among many other things that their practice does. Again, husband and wife team, I think. Okay, the last one I want to show, I mean, there's other practices I'm going to show, but the last one I want to show is Volt Trong. I probably did not say the name correctly. I mean, he's a super well-known architect, works a lot with bamboo. He's based off in Vietnam. And so, you know, again, there's there's just so much talent out there. Like, that's why I just don't like how some architectural schools might emphasize or overemphasize Starkitect's works, which, you know, there is obviously a lot of merit to their works, but there's just so many practices out there that you may not know of that are just producing amazing work. And I mean, thank goodness we have amazing websites that just expose all of these architects because it's so helpful and you learn a lot. Um, and so the reason why I'm showing these is just to let people know, like, you can find talent anywhere, you know, and everywhere. You don't have to be in like a specific city or a specific country. You can find it everywhere. And his work is just phenomenal. Whether he focuses a lot on brick and bamboo and stone, but another amazing architect to try. Uh, look, it's Voltron, the architect. I think, I mean, he, I think he's Vietnamese, but he speaks Japanese. And he actually, I think, has a lot of Japanese staff that work with him. And so, his work is just like this amazing blend of like local context driven materials and the mood. You can just feel the context in his projects, but then the details are super cool. The spaces are phenomenal. When I say phenomenal, I mean like the, th the theoretical sense of phenomenal, not like, Oh my God, phenomenal, but like uh, the actual theory of like phenomenology and stuff like that, where this idea of being aware of experience and stuff like that is very experiential, I guess. Maybe that's the correct term. Okay, so when you work in each of these sectors, when you work in the service-driven or service and design-driven or design-driven, you might start to ask yourself questions, right? So like, if you're working in like the design-centric practice, you might be there for a while. You might be like, you know what? I need more personal time. I'm working way too many hours, right? And I, this diagram probably looks very confusing. I'll explain. And so, you know, if you want more personal time, if you like look at the arrows over here, right? Or the dots, like more personal time, you're probably most likely going to transition over to like the service and design sector or you might transition over to the service sector. And like the faded ones, the ones that are lighter are like secondary, and then the darker ones are primary of like these like traveling arcs, right? Or also in the design-centric offices, you might want full exposure to want to practice. Like I want to talk to clients. I want to know about project overhead and practice overhead. I want to know, you know, how much to pay this and how much money to save on that and all these things. And so you might, you'll most likely go to the service and design sector. Or you want like more emphasis on construction documents and construction administration. Again, it does not mean that these service or the design centric offices don't do that. They do, but they don't do it as frequently, right? So they, they're not doing construction administration every week because maybe their projects are international. They might be doing like once a month or once every two months, they travel and check on the project status. They might have a project lead at the site, but in general, if you're just working on a project, you're not going to go every week to an OAC meeting like you would at a service and design. Or you might just want better pay, right? Again, I, I like I said, no one says, oh, I want to get paid very well and have so much free time and I want to work at a Starkitect's offices. Like no one says that. And so if you people who are saying that to themselves in like a design centric, they'll probably transition over to service and design or to a service driven office. Okay. Now, if you look at the service and design 
offices, the questions that you might ask yourself is, or, you know, once you're there, you might be like, I only want to design schematic design and design development. That's it. I don't want to do construction documents. I don't want to do construction administration. You know, that this stuff is boring for me. I don't want to do that. So if that's the case, you might transition to another service in design. You might talk to your principal and say, hey, I just want to do design, which probably won't happen because if the practice is small, everyone needs to work on something. Or you might transition to a design, like a architect's office. If it happens. I This is the part I wanted to talk about. I know people that have taken a 50% pay cut to work at a design, like at a star architect office or like, you know, design centric office. And I know people who are like, this is crazy. I don't want to work in this office setting ever again. And they go to a service and design office or they go to a service driven office. So you need to know what you want. You need to know, and you're going to get that after you get a little bit more experience and then better pay. Like you might work at another service and design office to get better pay or you might just transition over to the service sector right and just get better pay if you look on the bottom maybe you want to do less design you actually don't want to design anymore You're like i don't want to do design i just want to do production drawings i love production drawings i love construction documents i love construction administration i love to collaborate with engineers so you might transition to another service and design sector that gives that to you. Or like maybe if you work at a corporate office, you're like, Hey, just put me only on the technical side. I only want to do technical stuff. Or you might travel to the service sector where you're doing something that's just more frequent, more the same. Maybe you work for the developer or maybe you work for an architect of record office, you know, or maybe you work as, you know, like one of these in-house where you're doing like construction administration for all these projects. Right. Now, if you're on the service sector side, you might say, I want to do more design. I want to design more. So you might transition over to the service and design sector. Or you might transition over to the design centric, like star architect practices. And then the other two is, you know, you want full exposure to a practice and, you know, you want to do full exposure to construction documents and construction admin. Then you're for sure going to travis or tra uh, transition over to the service and design. If not, maybe in-house developer, maybe, but full practice exposure, definitely service and design. So you see like people are transitioning everywhere in this profession. Very rarely are you ever going to be like, this is the only practice I ever want to work for. There are instances like that, but most likely you're going to work for one or two or three. Some people do four or even five practices and it's going to change. And I would say that your first practice, that's when you start to realize what you want to, where you want to go. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more uh, towards the end. This is something that really annoys me in architecture school. You, you hear this all the time that like there's some instructor in there, some like jaded instructor that's in there that will say something like, Design is only 5% of the architectural practice. Like you, you'll hear that all the time. You'll hear like some like random percentage, like 5%, 10%. That's garbage. That's silly. That's baloney. Like, no, what? That's not true. Design in an architectural practice is a decision. You decide as the architect or as the owner of the practice, you decide as someone who wants to work for a practice, how much design you want to implement in the practice, okay? And I would say there's four categories that are contingent on this. One is first and foremost, intent. Let's say you own an architectural practice. Is design important to your practice and to the identity of your practice? So for some people, it is. And for some practices, it's not. For some practices, it's about efficiency. It's about turning over a lot of projects and making a lot of money and making things as simple as possible. And if something happens in construction, just change it as quickly as possible and, you know, uh, make it work. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just the reality. And you can learn things from those practices. Other practices? No, it's about the intent. It's about, I really want to pursue this 
certain ethos of design, whether it's about sustainability or people, context, materiality, details, engineering, construction, structure, like whatever you put, like there's something in that in the practice that is very explicit in your pursuit. Your client types, that's another deciding factor, right? That might influence your design. Your client types. So if you have like super high end developers, right? They're going to have very they're going to want to push the uh, like the identity of the design. So that requires you to really emphasize design as an example, or like high-end residential, or maybe, you know, it's a public project, you know, and they really want to change maybe the identity of affordable housing, for example, right? Or mixed income housing or transitional housing. You know, they, they don't want the housing to look like, you know, because there was a stigma to, affordable housing back in the 50s and 60s, right? And so a lot of times now, they really want to change that and not make it look like it's, I guess, the obvious identity of affordable. Like you can't even tell. It might look like a luxury condo for all you know from the outside. And so that need, you need to push design with that. Location is interesting because I actually want to show an example. Let me scroll. I don't know if I have it. Oh, yeah, perfect. So. If you look at, okay, this is, yeah, where are we? Yeah, we're in Haldenstein, I think, right? Let me zoom out. Yes. Okay, so you may know the architect Peter Zumthor. Peter Zumthor, I guess at one point, was a world-renowned architect. Like, you know, I mean, you want to talk about phenomenology and like experiential work, you talk about Peter Zumthor. I and mean, Peter Zumthor is like, you put that in the design-centric architect status, okay? But I mean, I'm not here to show off his work. His work is just put his name in and you'll see so much of his beauty. The work is just super cool. Very like, the work is almost like very spiritual when you look at it. But his office is literally like in the Swiss Alps. Like I'm not even exaggerating. Like his office is literally in like, I could be wrong, maybe his office moved to be honest, but I'm pretty sure his office is or was at a certain point in the Swiss Alps. It's like you got to do like a pilgrimage to go work there. <laughs> but I mean, this is literally his like here's Liechtenstein. Like, but I mean, this is his office in Haldenstein. I think like the Italian Alps is like right here, and the Swiss Alps is over here. But it's literally like rural Swiss Alps. And but he was doing world renowned work all over Europe. Right. And so and, and he did win, I guess, the LACMA project. I'm not sure that's still going on, but you know, he's done phenomenal work. Literally, like I'm both in both meanings, phenomenal, but like and his project, you know, his office is in the middle of like rural Swiss Alps. So it's not like in some major metropolitan city. And so I mean, I want to get Davos out of here. And so is a good example of both intent and location. Like you can be anywhere. And if your intent is to design, is that your architectural practice really emphasizes some character design, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in New York City or in the Swiss Alps, you know? So that's the thing. Design is a decision in a practice. And like I said earlier in the video, right, when I was showing, I think it was Thomas Pfeiffer's Glenstone Museum, it takes so much work to maintain design intent in a project, right? So like it takes so much work to try to maintain this from schematic design all the way to construction documents, balancing, what is it called? You know, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural, civil, lighting, landscaping, uh, you know, and then also like maintain your alignments and details and material consistency that's why design isn't just fine. You're designing all the way from start to finish in these types of projects. You get an RFI, you got to make about, you know, the soil's too high, soil's too low. Uh, we don't have this enough material in stock. You got to be like, okay, how do I maintain the design while also maintaining these design constraints? So you're always thinking about design. So when you hit like this caliber of design, or even like in Lake Flayo, right? When you're, when you're hitting, you know, this caliber of design, you're always thinking, I mean, just look at this. Like, you know, they didn't just put a random door in here. They put a door that matches the material consistency, right? And so they need to think about the structural support of this door, right? And then they're not just putting some like random thing there, right? There, there's an intent that goes there. And this 
then takes collaboration with the structural engineer. The structural engineer needs to know, you know, about the weight of this door and they'll help you decide, you know, the, what structural member you need to put on here to support the weight of the door, for example, you know? So uh, these things matter and these things don't stop at schematic design. That's why I think statements like 5% and like it's not, it's, it's, it's whatever you decide you want it to be. And so again, the the context matters, the location matters, because each location has like a, a cultural pulse to it, right? With how things look, with the aesthetic qualities of the buildings around you, the designs around you. So for example, here, like, you know, this is the, I think this is the Shibuya, right? Like in Tokyo, the way you design in Tokyo, right, is going to be different than the way you design in Amsterdam, right? Which is going to be different than the way you design uh, Texas, right? Houston, right? Uh, let me just scroll down. It's all creative comments. You're going to respond differently to your context. So, of course, maybe the areas you're in are not as design centric, but it doesn't not it's not an excuse not to design well, right? So that's why the other examples I showed before with these architects that are in the Midwest, in the South, uh, the North, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be like in a metropolitan city with high design. You can be anywhere. But you are going to respond differently to your context. And it might be more challenging to push the design in certain locations because it's just not the norm, right? You go to the Netherlands, for example, it's just very eclectic architecture. The same thing in Tokyo, same thing in uh, Paris. So it's easier to push the boundaries of design in certain contexts, but it doesn't necessarily mean because one context has less avant-garde design, for example, you can't do it. It's just that you might have to be more convincing about the way you do it. And then obviously program type. This is a good, another good example. Like you can design a beautiful bathroom. And I think, you know, Tokyo had this, I think it was Tokyo that had this program where they were designing like very famous uh, bathroom is by like famous Japanese architects. Like they had them by Toyo Ito and Kengo Kuma. And I think like Go Hasegawa or like um, uh, Shigeru Ban. And so it doesn't matter what the program type is. You can push any program type and give it a very novel design. I would say that winning in architectural practice is like four things. I mean, maybe for some it's five or 10 or one or whatever, but for me, it's four things. Number one is that and I actually have this in hierarchy, is that clients only want you. Because in the architectural practice, if you do not have a client, you don't have a practice. I mean, unless you're a developer, I mean, there's some architect slash developers now that are doing their own projects. But in general, the vast majority of, I would say, service plus design firms and star architect firms and the vast majority of architecture practices, they need a client. And so when a client only wants you, you know, and they are specifically coming to you for your design work or for your, the way you work, that's a huge win from a business model perspective, because then you don't have to talk about your fees or prove, you know, that you're a capable firm, right? And again, that goes back to like fostering relationships. That fostering part is already done because they're coming to you. There's already a level of trust there. So from like a business model, that's a huge win, right? That clients only want you. Secondly, which is very important right after you have a firm that has a stable clientele is that your staff, they feel fulfilled and obviously they're compensated fairly. This is very controversial topic in architecture about compensation that like deserves a different video, but your staff, you know, they need to feel fulfilled. They need to feel like they're providing, you know, people want to feel like they're giving back some way, right? Whether it's their efforts or the project types and obviously people need to be compensated. This work is so much work. Like people need to be compensated fairly. There's so much overwork in this profession. And then, you know, positively give back to the context. That's a huge win, you know, whether it's the demographic or the environment, right? Or the economy, so just give back in a positive way, right? Whether it's a public project for everyone to use that they've never really used before, housing that's for people who've never really experienced housing before. You know, I don't want to sound too like, I think more, I guess, uh, like dogmatic, but you know, it's always, it's, I guess, in my opinion, just very fulfilling to give back to the context somehow.
I need to also emphasize about this idea of winning when it comes to positively giving back to the context, for example. I know the examples I was showing was service and design offices that were more on the design leaning side. It doesn't mean that you have to pursue that. Maybe you just care about giving back to the context and maybe the aesthetics are not key. Maybe it's just a really simple building aesthetically that you might see that isn't really thought provoking, but the program is deeply impactful. Maybe you're providing a rec center in an area that never had a public recreation center or a, a public library that gives the public, that gives the context access to knowledge and education or a housing project. Again, I know I mentioned this earlier, but maybe it's not about the aesthetics. And even though I'm showing projects that are aesthetically driven, it doesn't always have to be about that. There's room for everyone in the architectural profession where they can all be impactful in different ways. I'm not trying to sound very kumbaya here, but it's just the reality. And I don't want this entire presentation to be like, check out all this beautiful work and all the beautiful work all over the world. There's no excuse where you can, no, you don't have to work in these types of practices if you don't want to. Maybe it really is about sustainability and only sustainability and aesthetics really isn't your priority. So I just really want to emphasize that, that, you know, getting all four is key, but maybe getting just two of them is key for you, you know, or maybe just getting one is key for maybe just, I just want to be compensated fairly. I don't mind about the project types. I just want people out of this space and there's room for you to go after things that you believe are important for you, but just uh, you need to be aware of the options. And then lastly, like thought provoking work, you know, work that pushes the boundaries of construction and engineering and materiality and space and form and whatever category you want to put that for me is like winning. It's really hard to get all four. Okay. So like you might work at a practice that has constant flow of clients, amazing pay, but the programs are horrible. <laughs> like maybe, okay, no, no, I gotta take that back. Cause that's too qualitative. Maybe the programs are like very exclusive, like billionaire condos, right? For some that's super cool and that they don't, they don't really care about, you know, who it's affecting, right? Or it's, you might have a firm that does like super thought provoking work. You're not getting paid as much. You know, it's hard to find all four. So it's ideal, but these are like, in my opinion, like the four winning categories. If you can get all four, that's like the holy grail. But obviously, if you can get three out of the four, that's amazing. Oh, that little asterisk on the bottom, clients only want you asterisk. That's because if you work for, a, if you're going after a public project in America, at least, you need to go through the RFQ, RFP process, right? It's not just here, I want you. Uh, but then again, if you are a firm that wins a lot of these RFQs and RFPs, RFPs, like I should say, they typically shortlist you and they'll, and they'll ask you to participate. And then obviously in Europe, it's just a healthy competition, public competition. Finally, you need to manage your expectations. This is something that's important in life, but also important with the clients and architects. And this is definitely a trajectory, okay? So where you start and where you land are going to be most likely very different. And sometimes the trajectories are very long, but not, and not high off the ground. And some trajectories are very high, but not very long. And some trajectories are both 45 degrees, <laughs> very high and very long, right? And so where you start with what your expectations are might change or they might not change. And so it's good to know what you're getting yourself into. It's good to know what questions to ask. And so hopefully this video is going to allow you to know what questions to ask. So if you go back to that pros and cons and look at the pros and cons and be like, okay, for me, it's really important that uh, I get exposed to the practice at first. And then maybe two years down the line, I want to really be exposed to design, or maybe I just want better pay, or I just want to, I want a more balanced lifestyle, or I want to be really just involved in construction administration. That's what really interests me. I'm not really into design. I really just want to see how things get built. And I really care about, you know, engineering or sustainability and, you know, sustainability systems and MEP systems, for example. These things are super important. You're not going to find it out immediately, but it's important to know what you're getting yourself into. You're not going to know completely what you're getting yourself into, but no, you know, maybe work culture is super important for you. You know, maybe work culture is something that is, uh, something that you really want to go after and you want to make sure, you know, like 
oh, do you guys do company outings? Do you guys have happy hours or do you guys do like, you know, Fridays off or do you guys, do, you know, things like that. Those things are important to you. You should really ask about those things. And you can kind of tell when you visit the office and get a feel for the office. One last note about this idea of trajectory. If you're a student in architecture school, you're going to see that some students are probably not even going to go into architecture at, when they graduate. They might go into UI, UX, fashion design, industrial design. And there's a lot of people also who start off in architecture and then branch off into tangential disciplines. Again, like UI, UX, or VR, like virtual reality, augmented reality, industrial design. Interiors, I would say, is definitely part of architecture. That's not really a tangent. That's part of the profession to begin with. There's some people who even go into like architectural sales, material sales. So I would say that this profession provides a lot of tangential disciplines that you can definitely branch into or branch off of if you want to. So the opportunities are endless in the architectural profession. So I hope this was very helpful. Again, I know I said I wasn't trying to promote any work. I'm not sure. Maybe I totally failed in that pursuit. But I just wanted to show that there's so much talent out there. There's so many architectural practices to pick from and to work for and to make as your own if you want to. And so managing your expectations and knowing that this is a trajectory is really going to help you, especially with your mental health, that maybe where I am now, this is not where I'm going to end up. So it's okay. And it's okay to make mistakes and to learn from this and uh, to move forward. I hope this was helpful. And please like and subscribe if you found this helpful. Again, thank you so much.